It's been mired in controversy for nearly two years. Now Virginia's parole board is about to get a major overhaul. Tonight, an update to a problem solver's investigation. Crime Insider John Burkett asked the governor-elect and attorney general-elect what will happen to the board after Inauguration Day. I've just been very consistent. I want to make sure that we have a complete fresh start. On January 15th, Virginia's new governor will be inaugurated. And one of the first things on Glenn Youngkin's agenda, shaking up the state agency that has power to grant inmates an early release from prison. And as I've said on day one, I will change out the parole board and we will have a new parole board on day one. It was a focal point of Youngkin's campaign and that of Virginia's next attorney general, Jason Miares. Parole board scandal, in my opinion, is one of the worst scandals we've seen in state government in decades. The controversy began in April of 2020. That is when CBS 6 was first to report that the board had granted parole to Vincent Lamont Martin. He had been serving a life sentence for the murder of Richmond patrolman Michael Connors, who was shot multiple times in the head near the VCU campus in November of 1979. Martin was eligible for parole, but Connors' family was outraged, saying they had not been given enough time to argue against his release. My father was just you know, grief stricken and sobbing. And he said, this, this is not going to go our way. This was a done deal. They're going to let him out no matter what we say. One month later, CBS 6 broke the news that Virginia's official government watchdog agency, the Office of the State Inspector General, had launched an investigation. OSIG ultimately found that the board and its former chair, Adrian Bennett, violated state law and its own rules in the way it handled Martin's parole. The Connors family had received written notification from the board on March 4th, 2020, at which time they were told they had three weeks to contest Martin's release. But the parole board's own rules afford 50 days for victims or victims' families to provide input. The investigation also found that the board did not allow the Connors family to meet with the board in accordance with its rules. A conference call between the family, Bennett, and a victim services coordinator had been scheduled for March 12th, but Bennett did not show up, according to the report. Additionally, the investigation determined that the parole board did not reach out to Richmond's top prosecutor about Martin's pending release within the required time frame. Some, including the Northern Administration, say that Martin's parole was unfairly politicized and have criticized the Inspector General's report. But the parole board itself came out with a point-by-point -point rebuttal to that six-page report, pointing out chapter and verse why they had concerns with OSIG's findings, why they did not think those were accurate. A third party investigation of the OSIG probe found that the lead investigator was likely, quote, impaired by personal bias. However, that investigation did not dispute OSIG's findings. And according to state officials, the Martin case was not an isolated incident. Subsequent inspector general investigations found similar faults in the way the parole board handled the release of half a dozen other inmates as well. And it's unconscionable that you had victims that found out that their loved one's killer had been released by this parole board, sometimes by just hearing about it on the nightly news. One of the official responsibilities of the attorney general is to assist the victims of crime. People should feel hurt, and that's exactly the frustration People feel like there's no transparency, no accountability. Miares is promising a thorough investigation of the parole board's actions. My goal is to make sure future parole boards never, ever, ever repeat the same mistakes as this one has. But while state Republicans all seem to be on the same page, some Democrats have concerns about the future of parole in Virginia. So I'm, I'm worried that, you know, that the, the governor is going to appoint people that just aren't going to give anybody parole, which I think would actually be bad for mor morale within the prisons. State Senator Scott Zervell says he is a supporter of second chances and believes that inmates who are eligible for early release should receive a fair and impartial hearing. I think people have to have that hope and you know we have to fulfill our promise to people when they're convicted that they're going to have a meaningful chance at parole if they can show they can redeem themselves. Youngkin tells CBS 6 the parole board needs to be above reproach with no agenda which is why he says he'll be appointing people who will look at the totality of each case that comes before them and make sure everyone involved has a chance to be heard. I want to make sure that we have a parole board that, yes, um, evaluates the appropriateness of granting parole, but also one that looks out for victims' rights as well. Again, the governor and AG elect will be sworn in on January 15th. Both say expect them to hit the ground running with this parole board issue. Coming up on CBS 6 News at 11, AG elect Jason Miares talks specifically about OSIG and what will happen if investigations happen during his tenure as the AG.